Uh, good morning. My name is Eva Twarkowski. I'm the Community Engagement Officer at local, Hunter Local Land Services. Uh, welcome to uh, the third live, live stream uh, workshop series, uh, Who is Living on My Land? Uh, this workshop will cover the three-month wildlife camera monitoring program that was undertaken at the end of last year across uh, a number of uh, properties in peri-urban areas in the Lower and Upper Hunter districts. Uh, the program uh, is designed to capture ver vertebrate pest animal species and in particular high priority uh, pest species, uh, in, particularly in the Milbradale and Broke areas. Uh, this will, uh, the information from the program will help inform uh, pest animal control uh, methods and identify options for um, a coordinated and target approach to feral animal control. Um, and oh, this will hopefully reduce the impacts and threats to native wildlife and um, livestock. Uh, so this is also part of a larger program uh, called the Every Bit Counts. Uh, and it, um, the Every Bit Counts um, program uh, aims to connect small landholders uh, in, um, in small landholders um, and identify appropriate um, resources, programs uh, and events to support uh, a range of uh, and a range and diverse um, agricultural activities. So for today's um, presentation, we'll have uh, Rosemary Rural from the Rural Environmental Management. Uh, she, will, she will provide the results um, and outcomes of the three month wildlife camera monitoring program, particularly for the uh, Milbradale and Broke areas. Uh, and then following that, we'll have um, uh, Matt Kennedy. Uh, um, he is the Regional uh, Weeds Coordinator and um, Matt will cover uh, the biosecurity legislation, also current uh, local land services programs uh, in the Hunter region. Uh, then we'll have a video presentation by Roy uh, Palmer. Uh, he's a landholder from the Milbradale area and he will provide an overview of um, uh, the situation around feral animals on his property. Uh, he'll share his experiences and also um, uh, describe some of the activities that he's been involved in on his property. Uh, he, he's available, he's available um, via the chat um, box uh, today, so if you um, would like to ask any questions, um, you are able to do that uh, during his presentation. And we'll also have um, feral animal demonstrations, uh, feral, feral animal control demonstrations uh, undertaken by, um, by Peter Rule, also from Rural and Environmental Management. We'll have a Q&A session at, at the end of every uh, presentation. Uh, and just a reminder that this is a live stream and uh, this is live streamed and it's an interactive workshop. So we really encourage you to send in your comments and your questions throughout the presentation and we'll endeavour to answer those. Um, you can also view the, the workshop, um, this workshop after um, the live stream session. Uh, so I really hope you enjoy uh, the workshop today and I hope you find it uh, informative. Thank you.
Good morning, I'm Rosemary, a part owner and environmental manager for Rural and Environmental Management. I hope you're all safe, healthy and well in this COVID-19 situation and hopefully you're really enjoying isolation out on your beautiful properties in the Milbradale and Broke area. Um, this morning I've been asked to present the findings to the Vertebrae Pest Management uh, Monitoring Program that um, our company undertook across the Hunter region. So um, I'll get started. This slide just runs through um, my presentation, just the topics that I'll cover, just so you know where this is heading. Um, so first of all, I'm going to provide an introduction and then um, introduce the areas covered by the program across the Hunter region. I'm going to provide a rundown on the methodology we used, how we position the cameras out in the field, just in case you're interested in um, undertaking this yourselves at a later date. I'm going to present the overall results of the program. I'm going to just run through a quick bit of discussion on those, and then we're going to hone in on the results for your local area. And I'll also just outline the recommendations that we came up with as a result of what we found out in the field. So just to begin with, um, to give you a little bit of background, Hunter Local Land Services engaged rural and environmental management to establish a strategic game camera monitoring program to identify the presence of animals as identified in this Hunter region um, strategic pest management plan uh, for the 2018 to 2023. Um, in consultation with Hunter Local Land Services, um, locations containing parcels of private land between 2 and 20 hectares on peri-urban interfaces across the Hunter region were chosen for the program and that was based on the presence of threatened species and endangered ecological communities was also um, based on land care activities um, in the Hunter and also Hunter catchment action plans that were taking place. So peri-urban areas were targeted um, on private land between 2 and 20 hectares and your, well, some of the areas um, um, are basically too small for traditional vertebrae pest um, management to be undertaken and are outside um, urban build-up areas or residential areas where domestic animals are dealt with by local government. Um, these parcels of land in these peri-urban areas, although are productive, um, in most cases aren't large enough to generate a full income. Thus, property owners aren't inclined to cull pest animals just due to time and expertise um, limitations. And also, usually they're not trying to protect an, an agricultural income. So these parcels of land fall into a grey zone. That is, they're too small for traditional local land services to assist with um, pest management techniques, including the 1080. And they fall outside of local council scope that is, council ranges are usually dealing with domestic dogs and cats, not those of a feral kind of description, um, including your wild dogs, uh, feral cats and foxes. So this next slide I'm putting up, um, basically, well actually it's the one after this, um, covers um, the areas that our program um, went out in the field with. So. Hunter Local Land Services identified 27 suitable game camera locations in priority peri-urban areas um, based um, in the land zone category of 2 to 10 hectares and then 10 to 20 hectare property holdings. The cameras were then divided into four zones across the lower and mid Hunter, consisting of the Broke Milbradale area, um, the East Gresford and Torryburn areas, the Greeter, Oswald, Brankston, Harpers Hill and Lincolnfield area and finally the Eagleton area and Shortland, Maryland area. So this next slide basically illustrates um, 
where the program covered. So you can see there a nice little map. All the areas that have blue triangles are the areas where the, proper, um, the strategic game camera monitoring program took place. So as far north as East Gresford and Torreyburn, um, as far southeast as Shortland and Maryland, and out as far as Broken Milbridale in the west. Um, in the centre location there, there's Brankston, Lincolnfield, Greeter, Oswald and Harpers Hill. So the next slide just um, zooms in on the Broken Milbridale areas. And this slide shows the six properties that um, the game cameras were set up on. The next slide illustrates the East Torreyburn properties that participated in the program. So you can see those four properties there. The next slide illustrates the nine properties that participated. And you'll see here on this, um, it probably highlights a little bit um, better the uh, peri-urban areas around the East Brankston, Brankston and Greeter area. All those outskirting areas, um, yeah, in those peri-urban sites. And finally, um, there's an Eagleton um, figure which shows the six properties that participated. And finally, down in Shortland and Maryland, you can see those two sites right on the edge of the built up areas um, down there. So um, next I'm just going to run through the methodology that um, our company used. Basically 28 motion sensor cameras were established across 27 properties in the Hunter region. The sites were chosen based on the optimal areas to study in peri-urban interface and also landholder interests. So thanks very much to all those property owners that allowed us to access their property to so set up cameras. We set up four types of motion sensor cameras. They range from scout guard, uh, five megapixels, right through to um, six, 16 megapixel wildlife cameras. So, we'll just go a little bit further into the methodology that we used. Um, GPS locations were taken for reference when the cameras were established on all of the properties. Cameras and SD memory cards were labelled with unique identities. Cameras were checked periodically over a 16 week period. Initially though, the cameras were set up and within a week we set back out to the properties to double check um, what was being recorded and whether um, the cameras were actually picking up what we're after. If they weren't, we relocated the cameras to other areas on the property just to see whether we could get any better results. Um, after the cameras were checked periodically over those um, 16 weeks and actually during the whole period, um, we'd take back the SD cards to the office and scroll through the numerous um, shots that were taken and the different species of fauna were then recorded and categorised according to whether they are a vertebrate pest, whether they are a native animal and then there was one other category and that was really for domestic animals or pets that showed up. This next slide just shows um, what the camera kind of looked like up close as well as um, a photo of what the camera looked like once it was set up and left in the field. This next slide I'll run through is basically um, on the positioning of the camera out in the field. So the following guidelines were used when establishing the um, game cameras on the participating properties. Um, it was preferable to choose a location where we knew there was animal activity and we ideally located the camera either at the end, junction or facing mid animal track. So we were likely to pick up the animal. 
The camera was set up either on a tree, a post, um, between knee and waist height um, from the ground, so approximately about one metre. This height targeted the majority of mid-range um, animals were after, cats, foxes and dogs, um, as well as um, larger size animals, for example, deer. So next we just use secateurs tires to cut any grass, twigs, branches that were in front of the camera that may have obscured the photos or triggered the, the sensor unintentionally. We made sure the camera was of course upright and secured to the tree or post with the strap provided. Uh, we undertook a test, so um, at approximately three metres to ensure that the region of interest was as expected. Um, if it wasn't, um, we used a stick or something similar to prop behind the camera just to align it if it was necessary. There was optional um, use of camouflaging the camera with um, additional paint leaves or twigs uh, and bark. Um, we, we did this down in one of the um, sites down towards Newcastle because it wasn't on private land and um, we got really good results there until the camera got stolen in the last week. Um, so if, as long as you're putting him up on private land or on your own land, you're usually safe. But um, if not, if you're out on public land, um, it's useful to camouflage. Um, finally, to avoid any false triggers due to temperature and other motion disturbances, just avoid aiming um, directly at a heat source such as the sun, heated stone or metal. So now we'll just move on to um, the fauna that we actually um, identified out on site. So this small table just summarises the pest animals that were actually captured on camera. Um, so we had wild deer, uh, wild dogs, um, European red foxes. We had wild deer, feral cats, wild rabbits, European hares, Indian minor birds. Um, moving on to the right column, um, the native fauna that we captured was kangaroos and wallabies, of course, possums, both ringtail and brushtail, native birds, echidnas, um, common wombats, lizards, including bearded dragons and lace monitors, or goannas, uh, bats, and um, we've got koalas down there. We actually didn't capture the koalas on camera, but in the last week um, when we were collecting the cameras, um, one of the participating property owners um, advised that they'd received a flyer um, to say that um, koalas were actually seen tracking through their property. So we thought we'd just note that one down. This next slide basically provides a graph that um, is representative of what um, we found across the 27 properties. So, um, interestingly enough, 92% um, of the properties that we're out on recorded at least one vertebrate pest. Um, we're actually quite surprised with the number um, the number of vertebrae pests that were actually captured on the cameras right across all the properties. Um, overall, the highest, um, I suppose, um, captured animal was um, 19 out of the 20 properties had foxes captured on the cameras, followed by 10 stray or feral cats out of the 27 properties. 10 of them had cats um, captured on film. Um, nine of the 27 properties had hares, rabbits, or a combination of both. Um, six um, properties out of the 27 had deer. And um, in actual fact, six out of six properties in the Eagleton area had the deer. Um, Three out of 27 properties had wild dogs, once again, in the Eagleton area. Um, there were the three wild dogs. And finally, there was some um, Indian miners caught on one of the 27 properties. Um, please note that the cameras weren't set up to monitor birds, but um, 
I think there was about 20 species that ended up being captured across the 27 properties. The next slide um, basically provides a graph of the native fauna that was captured on the cameras. And um, it was nice to see that um, 27 out of the 27 properties recorded native fauna of some description. Um, 19 out of the 27 properties had kangaroos or wallabies identified or captured on their, their cameras. So you'll see that in the blue. Um, 19 out of the 27 properties again had birds of some um, species or another. Uh, 10 out of the 27 properties had brush-tailed possums. Um, 3 out of the 27 properties captured wombats on cameras. Um, another three properties had echidnas um, captured. Three out of the 27 properties had lace monitors. A further three out of the 27 properties had ringtail possums captured on film. And finally, um, one out of the 27 properties had a bearded dragon, one had um, a micro bat, and one had a, a koala. Once again, that koala wasn't actually captured on camera, but um, it was um, seen on the property by a neighbour um, the final week of the program. This next slide um, just gives a nice graph of the native birds that were captured um, on the cameras. So, um, a property in Greta had as many as seven different um, bird species um, flitting in to get a, a photo taken and um, it was followed by the next highest number of bird species, six out at um, Eagleton. As mentioned, um, they, the cameras weren't set up to capture any bird life so this was just a plus um, and I'd like to just note that the three graphs that I've just shown um, only represent the type of um, pest identified. It doesn't give any indication of the actual number of those species um, out on the site. So what I've got next is just a small video which captures um, a selection of the vertebrae pests that were captured on um, the cameras out on properties. So, um, as I mentioned, at least one vertebrae pest was um, photographed on 92% of properties. 70% of properties had European foxes captured on camera. So it's a little bit hard, some of these, they're a little bit dark. 37% of properties that participated had feral or stray cats captured on the camera. And I just want to note here that um, any cats that were captured on the camera that had a collar on were removed out of um, the results because we, we noted those as domestic pets. But it's worthwhile noting that even though these cats um, are housed at home and fed well, their natural instinct out in the field is actually actually to, um, I suppose, um, you know, try and um, capture, you know, native animals and other animals out in the field. So that fox there was after um, chickens, I think, that were in a chicken coop on one of the properties. So 33% of um, the properties had either wild rabbits or hares on the property. Wild deer were captured um, on six of the six cameras in the Eagleton area. That photo there shows a nice little litter of foxes. There was, I think, three or four um, foxes that were in that shot. Um, Wild dogs um, were captured on 11% of the properties, or three out of the 27 properties, but they were definitely um, located in the Eagleton area. One minor bird, uh, or one property had minor birds um, captured on film. So that little fox has captured something. I'm hoping it's not native. 
And um, out in this area, um, cats, there were lots of feral cats out here, or wild cats, um, foxes, and then there's plenty of um, wild dogs captured um, on this camera out in the Eagleton area. I don't think I'd like to be bailed up by any of those going for a walk, so. Um, plenty of deer, as you can see from these shots, and wild dogs that are, are tracking um, where those deer have been. So um, very interesting results, um, you know, for choosing out of those 27 properties, having 92% of them have um, one form or another of um, vertebrae pests was quite alarming. And um, I think, I suppose the other thing to note is that um, the camera was only set up on one small area of these properties. Um, if multiple cameras were set up um, and on a much larger scale throughout these peri-urban areas, um, it's very interesting to know um, what the numbers of vertebrae pests would be like lurking around. So hopefully that snapshot of what was found out there um, is of interest to you, that last little fox. So um, moving on now, we've got a, another little video, um, which is a collation of photos that were taken um, of native animals that were captured on site. So um, bearded dragons and ducks, um, bowerbirds, possums um, and look at wombats. As mentioned, um, like the number of animals, uh, the, the number of each different vertebrae pest wasn't actually tallied up. Um, just due to the difficulty, mostly because nighttime shots, you can't, um, we couldn't really decipher whether they're the same individual or um, or different ones. Um, in most cases, there were multiple um, n multiple dogs or multiple foxes, and definitely multiple um, possums and birds on the various um, cameras. Yeah, it was just um, a difficult in the end with the number of photos that we had um, deciphering that. So. Um, once again, lots of native wildlife out there. There's an echidna in that photo. Might be a little bit difficult for you to see, but he was out um, eating during the evening. A couple of males ready to have a fight there. So lots of possum activity, um, large lace monitor lurking around. So it's amazing what's out and about on properties. Um, you can be none the wiser. So hopefully these little um, snapshots are of interest to you. Little echidna out walking. So on this side it was, um, I don't think it's included in this video, but there was a good shot of a black snake sliding through the, the background. Got a family of possums there. A 
another couple of possums out and about. So we should see about the end of um, these native birds um, and animals out on the properties. But definitely um, all of the properties, 20 out of the 27 properties, um, the cameras definitely captured um, native animals. So I ran through most of this discussion while those um, videos were rolling. Um, dominant foxes, uh, foxes were the most dominant, followed by um, stray or feral cats. Wild rabbits followed closely behind the, the stray cats or wild cats. Um, deer followed wild dogs and finally um, um, Indian minor birds. Um, just due to the significance of pest animals, it's strongly apparent that peri-urban areas require assistance in managing, controlling and eliminating vertebrae pests, which will in turn assist our native wildlife. Oops. So we're just going to move on to um, pest results in your local area. That's for the Milberdale Broke area. Um, as you can see there in front of you, um, cats, um, well actually five out of the six um, properties um, captured foxes on, um, on camera, followed by four out of the six properties having either hares, rabbits or a combination of the two. Um, and finally three out of the six properties um, captured uh, wild or feral cats. As discussed before, any cats that had collars on were removed from these result numbers. So um, just going back to that one, um, if you know of local um, cats that are pets that don't have um, collars on, you may have been able to recognise them in those um, slides. Um, if they didn't have a collar, they were um, noted as ferals or stray. So this next slide um, shows the native um, fauna captured on cameras out there. So um, five of the six properties um, captured kangaroos and wallabies. Five of the six um, captured um, birds of some description. Four out of the six properties had um, brush tail possums that were captured on camera. Three out of the six properties had wombats that were um, busy. Um, one, I think there was a family of three that um, were getting around. Two out of six had ringtail um, possums. One site had a nice lace monitor, or otherwise it may have been known as a um, goanna out there. And lastly, a microbat was captured on one of the cameras. Um, this next slide shows the native birds um, captured out in the Broke Milbradale area. So two properties had three different species and yeah, two had two species and one, one property had one and one property had none at all. There was 20 various um, species across the whole program that was um, um, identified. So um, these are just the results of the um, pests for the Milbradale area. And I don't know if anyone knows who that cat is. It was noted as a wild or a stray. So um, this is just a quick snapshot to show that all these pests exist out that way.
So plenty of foxes, cats, European hare. Another fox. As mentioned before, there were lots and lots, another cat. There were lots and lots of foxes captured. This is just a couple of photos of them, so um, rabbits. Another fox. So just picking up, um, you know, the number of foxes on these properties, um, I suppose if you extrapolate that out and um, figure out how many more might be in and around the area based on us only capturing um, some of them just goes to show um, what kind of impact they'd be having on our local native wildlife. Next is just um, yep, a quick summary of the native fauna captured on film out in the Milbradale Broke area. So you might see these regularly or you may have may not have known that they existed out and about so oh that I was just going to say there was a bat on that previous um, previous slide with the buckets it's quite difficult to to see but um it was a small micro bat it's a cute little possum getting a piggy bat by mum a large lace monitor there lurking around beautiful big birds So all those properties were really busy. Um, so next we just come through to um, the recommendations that we came up with just as a result of um, the program. Um, we just recommended that community education programs be undertaken to assist peri-urban property owners to manage, control and eliminate vertebrae pests on their properties. Um, we suggested that those programs include background information on the vertebrae pests but also provide training and advice in methods and procedures to control, manage and eliminate these pests. Where possible, supply of materials, equipment and traps to capture and remove vertebrae pests from pro properties. And um, I suppose finally, just with um, feral or wild cats, uh, we recommend that Hunter Local Land Service um, collaborate with local councils across um, the Hunter region, just to provide a streamlined process for removal and capture, because various councils have different ideas or um, policies with relation to cats, and you know whether their pound will actually accept them, or whether their vets that they've um, got a relationship or um, um, have got something organised with will accept them and either destroy them or rehome them depending on what kind of state the cats are in. Um, in extreme cases, um, for example, with the wild dogs and the deer in the Eagleton area, we recommend a collaborative approach um, or program for Hunter Local Land Services, um, local councils, state forests, larger land holders such as Hunter Water and peri-urban property owners um, is recommended going out and doing um, or trying to set up something just on your own place um, without the um, collaborative approach of all the neighbours and authorities. Um, I mean it's great doing that but in the end you'll find that you might get rid of a dog or a cat or um, a fox on your place but you know another one will move in um, pretty quickly just because um, other people aren't doing the same thing um, so we recommend yep working together as a group locally and then yeah um, working in then with Hunter Local Land Services, your local council and any other larger authority in your area that can assist. Um, 
I'm close to the end of my presentation and I'm just recommending that if you've got any questions, um, you start typing away and send those through and um, hopefully I'll be able to answer any of those questions that you may have. Um, and if not, we can organise um, an answer if it's too difficult. Um, but I'll um, finish up there and um, leave it to the question and answers now. So I'll probably just um, disappear for the next um, one or two minutes. So if you've got a question, um, type it up and send it in. And then Eva will relay that to me in a couple of minutes. So if you've got no questions and you'd like to grab a cup of tea or stretch your legs, do so. And we'll see you back shortly.
Hey everyone, I'm Matt Kennedy from Local Land Services. I'm gonna be talking today a bit about general information of pest animal control and your duty as landholders, as well as giving a bit of advice on control options, particularly in the Broken Milbedale area. So, in New South Wales, pest animals are managed by the Biosecurity Act 2015. Uh, this act sets out a shared responsibility for all people of New South Wales. This includes government industry and every landholder. Uh, the idea here is to work together to protect our economy, our environment and our community from the impacts of pest animals. Public and private land managers all have a shared responsibility um, equal to each other to eliminate and minimise these biosecurity risks posed by pest animals. Regional strategic management plans have been created across all LLS regions. Um, these help to set out guides for participation and coordination for pest animal control, as well as providing best practice management. Government plays a key role in coordination of pest animals in New South Wales, with DPI being the lead agency for terrestrial and aquatic incursions, and local land services being the deliver delivery of pest animal control and advice for landholders, um, and providing a function of training up landholders to perform that control themselves. The key aspect of the Biosecurity Act is a general biosecurity duty. On the left there we can see how that's worded in the Act, but what that really translates out to be is that any person who owns or occupies lands or interacts with the land being uh, plant animals soil should know the impact of working or owning land in that space. All reasonable actions should be taken to prevent or minimise any impacts. So when we're talking about pest animals, what we mean here is that if you, you have a duty to control pest animals on your land uh, that you either manage or own, and so to control them as far as reasonably practical to prevent, eliminate or minimise any biosecurity risks. So this responsibility is of the landholder themselves. Uh, it's not for LLS or other agencies to undertake on their behalf, but we come in to help and facilitate that control. What I've got pictured here is the Hunter Regional Strategic Pest Animal Management Plan. So this one's specific to the Hunter region. Um, so it's under the Biosecurity Act, pest animals are no longer defined by the Act itself. It does have mandatory measures in it, but each region sets out the priorities for their region. So this plan sets out ours for the Hunter. Um, Biosecurity regulation does outline mandatory controls that everyone in New South Wales has to abide by. For example, it is illegal for a person to keep uh, move or release a feral pig, a wild rabbit or a fox. General control and management and best practice are outlined in our regional plan here. Um, following recommendations that are outlined in this plan is a way for a landholder and individuals to discharge their biosecurity duties so that they've met their obligations under the law. Now I'm going to be talking about control options but I thought it's important just to mention when I'm talking about baiting what I'm actually talking about. So, the next, so in New South Wales, we use sodium fluoroacetate, which we call 1080, to poison animals. In Australia, it's used and also around the world. In New South Wales, it's registered for use on wild dogs, foxes, foxes rabbits and feral pigs. The usage of 1080 is controlled in New South Wales by the EPA through a pesticide control order. Uh, this sets out all the finer details on the usage and what, what we must do when we use it. Um, it is important to know that we are talking about a poison and there can be negative consequences if people don't use it right and that's why everyone must be trained in its usage before it can be handed out as well as LLS staff undertake risk assessments and put in place measures to reduce the risk so that there is no off-target uh, damage. Things LLS staff must take into consideration is distance restrictions to uh, dwellings as well as property boundaries, close the proximity to towns or built up areas. Um, what type of landscape we're working in, are we, are we working in a rural setting, are we working in a more peri-urban setting, um, and what the, what the nature of that landscape is. After considering all these aspects, LLS and the landholder wanting to perform the baiting sit down together and they figure out whether the risk is too high or whether some control measures can be put in place to minimise this risk, and then whether or not the baiting can occur or not occur. Um, so I do have some toxicities on the side here. So you, these, these are average numbers, but the reason I throw this up is when I was performing a, a lot of baiting programs, I'd always get a lot of questions about the toxicity um, to birds and goannas. I'd get a lot of feedback that birds and goannas are dying from 
fox baiting and dog baiting programs, and I believe this is a lot of misinformation, uh, and this isn't, isn't actually occurring in the environment. Um, you can see here that it, the amount of baits that a goanna needs on a fox baiting program is 93 baits to actually die. And if we're talking dog baits, that's halved, but there's no, there shouldn't be a physical way for a goanna to have access to that many baits, as well as it shouldn't actually be able to stomach the amount of baits to actually kill itself in a city. Same with when we come to eagles and other birds like that. Um, while I do have 1080 here, we also do issue pindone, which is a poison registered for use on rabbits in New South Wales. Once again, it is a poison as well and should be used in line with its recommendations, but it, is, it takes a lot more pindone to kill domestic animals, 100 milligrams to kill a dog as opposed to three milligrams of 1080. Once again, before we jump into control techniques, I just wanted to go over a few aspects of trapping. Um, so these are considerations before anyone sets up a control program or jumps into something, they really need to think about how they're going to do this and how they're going to continue the whole program. So for example, we've got traps here. So we, we're talking about foothold traps as well as cage traps, which Pete Raw will go into a little bit more detail later in his video. So some questions to ask yourself is, do you have the ability to humanely kill the animal that you're planning on trapping? Like that, is, that is a main concern here. We don't want to be inhumane to these animals. We want to make sure that they are, can be killed quickly and appropriately. Um, do you have the ability to check your traps daily? It's a legal requirement to check your traps daily. So you can't set a trap, walk away for a week or go on holidays and come back and have that animal in pain and suffering. You need to check those traps. So you need to think about your control program in its entirety. Your placement of your traps. So are you aware of where you should be setting your traps? Is you, have you set it in direct sunlight or have you put it in shade? Are you, once again, are you being humane? But also, do you know what you're actually doing with these traps? Um, any other legal requirements that may need to be considered here, which we'll go into a bit more in detail about firearms, but just um, do you actually have the right to trap the land you're trapping on? Is it your property or is it somebody else's? So when we're talking about trapping animals, you, one of the most humane ways of uh, killing that animal is to shoot it. So you have to have a firearms license in this case. Um, shooting should only be performed by skilled operators who have necessary experience with firearms and who hold the appropriate licences. Um, storage and transportation of firearms has to meet legal requirements set out by the New South Wales Police. Firearm being used is at the right calibre for the animal you're trying to kill. Um, information on calibre sizes and all that can be found on the PestSmart website. Um, shooting in a manner which causes immediate death to the animal. So we, we're talking shots there that are well placed. You need to be confident in your ability to shoot if you're going to use a firearm to humanely destroy an animal. Um, the legalities around shooting in built up areas. So if you're in a very peri-urban landscape and you're firing a gun, it's always best to check with police to advise them to, so they know that a gunshot is about to occur as well. Um, and not every landholder has a firearms licence these days, so it's, this is when I talk about groups forming as well as getting in contact with your neighbours for control programs, there's usually someone who does have a firearm around and it's best to have all those procedures in place ready to go before you undertake that program. So we'll move on to some, we'll move on to the controls, but first off I'll introduce the expectations here and examples of control. This is directly taken out of our regional strategic pest plan. This is the type of information provided in it for every species that is a, that has declared as pest in the, in the Hunter region. Um, the strategic objectives for wild dogs is to reduce the negative impacts of wild dogs on stock and landholders utilising best practice techniques. Um, ensure all areas of the region are covered by a best, pra a best practice wild dog management plan. Uh, support landholders to undertake coordinated in control programs, ensuring that they are accredited to use 1080. Support dingo conservation and management in identified conservation areas. Undertaking activities that in so undertaking the examples here is basically a way for a landholder to prove they've discharged their biosecurity duty in line with the Hunter Regional Plan and the Biosecurity Act. The European Red Fox, so once again the examples here 
of um, landholder activities and expectations are taken straight out of our Hunter plan, so you should check that out, um, available on our website. The strategic objectives for the Red Fox is to reduce the negative impacts on stock, um, utilising best practice, support landholders to undertake coordinated baiting programs once again um, with trained effective control. Develop, res develop and resource, resource long-term programs to reduce fox numbers, um, to reduce their impacts on biodiversity and threatened species. Um, in the interim, to help facilitate focus on saving our species programs run by national parks, um, and to reduce the, their numbers in a peri-urban environment. So what I've just got here on this map is the breakup of the wild dog um, management plan areas for the hunter. Um, a lot of these management plans have been signed off. Uh, some are still under development, but at these these geographic areas here also represent good um, landscape approaches to pest animal management. So they could be applied at a broader scale than just a wild dog management plan, but also um, when whole pest plans are developed, these are the landscapes we are looking at. The Broke Milberdale area in particular is covered by the Central Hunter Wild Dog Management Plan. So I've got a few controls here for foxes and wild dogs, and I've placed foxes and dogs together because the same techniques are used for, these, for both these species. Um, and usually a wild dog program will also target foxes at the same time. Um, so poison baiting is our primary control for wild dogs and foxes. Um, the, as long as all distance restrictions can be met in the Broken Milberdale area, then 1080 baiting is an option. It does occur to some extent. We have all of the mine sites surrounding this area that undertake baiting twice a year um, for three weeks at a time. Uh, this is coordinated so all the mines go at the same time, as well as with the Singleton Military Area also baits at least once a year. And we have national parks that base bait once a year as well in this area. Um, as well as trapping that does occur on those sites to follow up these baiting programs. Um, when we're talking about baiting here, it is very important that the distance restrictions and the landscapes taken into account. So LLS staff will talk with the landholders to make sure it's an adequate um, property that can be baited. Um, either failing baiting being an option or as a follow-up technique for dogs that just won't take baits, we've got trapping. So we're talking using soft draw traps in particular. These are designed to hold an animal in place but give no long-lasting um, injuries. If we get an off-target, it can be released. Cage traps are also an option, although dogs aren't readily, readily take to cage traps, but foxes do, so where baiting isn't really an option. Cage traps can be utilised in that very peri-urban urban environment to um, capture a fox. Um, shooting is a last resort for dogs and foxes. It is a good way to take out some numbers, but it is an opportunistic, even planned shooting programs can't be relied on as a sole program and should be used to follow up these other programs. So I'll move on to some rabbits here. So once again, we've got our expectations and examples taken straight out of the plan, so check that out. The objectives for wild rabbits are to reduce the negative impacts of rabbits on grazing land and biodiversity through a coordinated program to substantially reduce rabbit numbers in a long term. Support landholders to meet their general biosecurity duty utilising best practice. Our controls for rabbits, um, First off, primary control again is poison baiting. Um, we have two options when it comes to poison baiting rabbits in New South Wales. As mentioned earlier, we have 1080 for more of these rural settings where distance restrictions can be met, as well as it's safe to do so. In a more peri-urban environment, um, bordering on even urban, you can utilise pindone poisoning for, for a rabbit control program. Um, Pindone is available at a local rural merchant store, but be, just be advised to follow the directions on that label as that is best practice and that is your legal requirement. Um, a typical 1080 program would take just over a week to complete with free feeding, so, and a Pindone program takes about two weeks to complete with free feeding. 
What I mean by free feeding is you present carrots to, a, to the rabbit population beforehand with no poison on them to determine the extent that the rabbit population will eat. So we get the right amount of poison into that population as well as we train them to eat that carrot so it's ready so they'll uptake it when we do poison them. But also it determines whether we have any off targets that are taking our poison. Um, we wouldn't want any off-target species to die as a result of it, so it's used as a risk control to make sure we're actually targeting the species we're trying to target. Uh, control measures such as the one featured in the middle there can be impl implemented to reduce the risk of other animals coming in and taking that poison bait, and the rabbits will willingly enter these devices and still eat the carrot that we poison. RHDV is a biological control. Uh, it's applied in the same way as poisons are, as it's applied on carrots. Um, RHDV is a Khaleesi virus and it only targets rabbits. The last strain we had wasn't as successful as we'd hoped. It had a variable result from some sites doing 0 to 100% reduction in population with an average around 60% population reduction. Uh, but as new strains become available, LLS coordinate wide scale releases of Khaleesi virus. Um, all three of these are options in the Milberdale area. It just depends on your local situation. Um, harbour destruction is where we actually take out the harbour where the rabbits are actually living. And by doing this, we're actually gaining long-term effects. Likewise, though, it, it isn't a primary control measure. It's to supplement or to follow up your uh, poisoning control. It is the real only way to gain a long-term effect though because if you've just poisoned a population of rabbits and got a 90% reduction but you've still got that harbour there, new rabbits will come in and move in straight away. We can remove harbour by um, ripping a warren complex with backhoe tractor of the like. Um, if we're to but sometimes, like on the picture on the right there, rabbits will get established under old timber. You've got to you know, burn this off, pick it up, or old piles of brick, old rubbish laying around sites. You've got to pick this up and clean it up, as it is harbour for these rabbits, and you won't gain any long-term effect by not controlling that. Fumigation of warrens. So where you've got a warren that might be on a creek bed or somewhere else where you just can't get to it, you can fumigate them. Once again, um, the fumigation tablets are available at a rural merchant, but make sure you read the label on this and are accredited to use it as they are, they are toxic. Um, for a real success with fumigation, you need a smoker and professional controllers do have smokers available. And this is to make sure you're actually closing up every hole available. Um, shooting will move on there. So once again, shooting isn't a control measure in itself. It is used to follow up these other control measures just to take out that residual population that is stuck around either you know, after we've poisoned them or after we've ripped their warrants. So feral pigs. Um, even though feral pigs hadn't shown up in the broken Milberdale area, I know from my experience in that working in that space that feral pigs are a problem along the brook and um, some of the land surrounding area. Um, so we have the expectations and examples of uh, what's expected of land managers out there. Our strategic, strategic objectives for feral pigs is to reduce the negative impacts of feral pigs on agriculture and biodiversity, support landholders to undertake coordinated control and provide training, traps and baiting products, ensure proactive approach to feral pig management and effective cross-tenure coordination. So when we're talking about control options for feral pigs, once again our primary control is poisoning. Um, the reason being that we can establish a whole group control in a short time, so we free feed the same way we do with rabbits. We establish how much that population will eat in one sitting, therefore gaining a whole population control in one go. Um, this, uh, this baiting does occur in the Broke Milberdale area. Um, some of the mine sites do do it and some, a Singleton military area has done it in the past as well. Um, trapping is also conducted on mine sites and the Singleton military area and within national parks in the um, vicinity of the Broken Milberdale area. So but 1080 baiting with pigs is a lot different than with rabbits and wild dogs. It does use a lot more poison. So the Broke Milberdale area is limited in its usage of 1080 for pig control. It really does come down to what properties we're looking at here. 
because we're not just talking about the distance restrictions to dwellings and boundary fences, but we're also talking about how far that pig can travel after it's taken its poison. So we need to take every, all those risks into account and we add layers of control on top of that. Um, trapping is a viable option in this Broke Milbedale area, though solely relied on trapping isn't a great control. If it's done in a coordinated landscape approach, it can have good results. Um, when we're talking about trapping, we've got a picture of one on the right hand side there. Um, it's, it can be tricky to trap feral pigs, particularly if they've had a lot of interactions with humans. Um, if there's a lot of hunting pressure placed on them, they do get skittish, and if they've been tried to be trapped before and unsuccessfully, they do start to learn some avoidance techniques there. Um, it's a good control option though when 1080 can't be used. So LLS staff do provide traps um, for land holders, but once again, you do have to have a way of humanely destroying these pigs once you're trapped. Uh, ground shooting programs are, a, um, are a, a good way to take care of pigs, but once again, they're solely, they, by themselves, they do not actually reduce the population. Uh, they can form part of this integrated approach though, following up on some trapping and some baiting programs, taking out those stragglers that would, just would not be trapped or taken bait. Um, Though, on the other hand, coordinated aerial shooting programs are used as a primary technique. This is where LLS staff and National Park staff through the FAST program undertake broad scale aerial shooting programs, uh, coordinated usually with large landholders or industry groups to provide a, a large knockdown of population. So feral cats do feature in our Hunter's Regional Strategic Plan as well. Our strategic, strategic objectives are to reduce the impacts of feral cats on threatened species, support research and effective control techniques um, and strategies for cats, including development of biological controls and non-lethal strategies, develop and resource long-term programs to reduce feral cat numbers below critical thresholds, encourage responsible cat ownership with local government in Companion Animal Act controls, support identification and awareness of key assets in the region that are impacted by feral cats, integrate feral cat management with other predator management. Control options for feral cats are quite limited in New South Wales though. There's no registered poison available. Uh, at a federal level, there is research going on to develop a bait product that is more target specific as well as some other trapping aspects to feral cats. Um, when, when we can trap them though using cage traps and foothold traps, they, but they are a natural predator. They're killing machines that are developed um, to kill rather than to eat. So it's, it's quite hard to lure them into a trap uh, with food, same as it is to bait them. It is quite difficult. We um, need to come up with some ideas to, on how to get them and lure them into our traps there. Um, once again though, uh, local land services and some councils do provide traps. Uh, we have some traps available in the Singleton area for Broke Milberdale that are more of a fox size, but you can buy uh, feral cat traps as well. So it's not to discourage you trying to use it, it's just that it is a technique that needs to be developed. Um, shooting programs as well, once again, it's hard, it's quite difficult to control feral cats in that way. Um, you will get some results if you target and plan it, but realistically it isn't, it isn't a population knockdown that you require. When considering any feral cat control program though, you do need to speak to your local council or vet and understand that if you're trying to trap a cat, then there may be legal requirements if you believe it to be a domestic animal. Um, so you need to speak to your local council or a local vet and have in place those measures ready to go before you decide to put a trap out. So you understand what you're going to do with that live animal when you have it. So I'm just uh, finalising up, I've got one more slide here, but if you've got any questions, just post them in so that Eva can relay them to me at the end. Uh, forming groups. So I thought it's very important to discuss this as Landscape approaches to feral animal control is realistically the only way to get a reliable long-term knockdown on population and get them to a manageable level. So we, we need to understand in our local area, we need to start forming groups of people that work together in a coordinated way. Um, there's, no real, there's no real aspect there of you know, what's the right group. It depends on the local area. 
in the Broken Milverdale area, we've already got the Broke Bulga Landcare group that could gain good traction with gaining, um, with forming control groups and organising people as they do with weed control. Um, there's also the single, North East Singleton Wild Dog Association that covers the whole of Central Hunter area. Um, it can be utilised as a good, a good tool to join that group and start facilitating that um, wide scale wild dog control. Um, as well as less formalised groups of landholders getting together and just understanding that setting dates and coordinating their baiting programs to be in sync with each other. Um, particularly in your area where we have national parks, singleton military area and the mining sites all coordinated to bait at the same time each year. This, gain, this gets us a really good landscape approach. We need that same landscape approach when it comes to the private landholders. Um, groups, help land, group, groups help LLS um, manage their pest, help to facilitate pest animal management. Um, groups help their landholders to be active by reminding them and forcing, uh, pushing that control within their local communities instead of LLS coming in and trying to push control on landholders that might be more reluctant. Um, groups streamline processes by having lots of people coordinated and ready to go and receiving all the same information rather than everyone individually receiving it from an LLS officer. Uh, groups act as their local driver to help facilitate us as well so that you know it reduces our time and workload when we come in and they've got a group that's quite active and ready to go. Um, local groups working together also can reduce the risk posed by 1080 baiting. Uh, these, if the local community is quite aware that you know significant portions of it are baiting, then it entices people to actually control their domestic animals during our baiting programs. So we have uh, no off-target kills, and everyone feels the program runs safe and coordinated and can continue forward. Uh, feral scan, which I've got pictured there, is is a good tool that can be used by groups to help communicate and coordinate. Um, programs between each other as well as it's a good way for t a good recording tool for landholders to inform each other of what's going on as well as LLS staff being informed of the stock attacks or impacts of um, feral animals. Uh, when Also when groups formalise themselves they can start applying for funding so you can take some, take some of that burden off yourself if, particularly if you're not an agricultural producer but you can start applying for funding sources for your formalised groups. Uh, some of the mining sites as well as state and federal bodies issue funding for pest animal control or to increase um, productivity of agricultural lands. So just remember that animal, pest animals need a broad scale coordinated integrated approach. It's not a simple solution when controlling pest animals. The whole community need to work together so that we really do gain the benefits for our economy, our environment and our local communities. LLS here is, help, is here to help. So just get in contact with us and talk to one of your biosecurity officers in your local area. Thanks. So uh, no questions have come in uh, yet. Hopefully uh, people are typing away. Um, but I do have a question. Um, how long should um, a, baiting, a nominated baiting program or trapping program go for in a particular area? What sort of, that, what sort of time frame are we looking at? So in, with the mining companies and national parks, what I always recommend is a three week program for baiting. Um, the first week we're really we're showing, we're presenting those baits out there and we'll get a lot of fox takes for wild dog baiting. Um, the second week we start to get our dogs and our foxes still and then the third week we're still getting dogs and foxes. Um, the results show that even over that three week period baits are still taken and it's good to have fresh baits replaced on a weekly basis available for these species so that we're not giving them a subpar lethal dose as well as it's also responsible to pick up your baits um, afterwards when your program's finished up to make sure your area is secure and you can give that peace of mind to the other people in your area. Uh, when we're talking a feral pig control program, we usually do a one stop, we usually hit it hard because the population, we should know how much that local population is going to need so we can take it out in one sitting. Uh, rabbit control program is the same, we, we hit that whole population in one go. We can follow up with supplementary poisonings or control but realistically we come back in when the problem starts to build back up. Uh, also, uh, Matt 
I've just got one more, one more question. Uh, you just you mentioned uh, about forming a coordinated group. I was just wondering what is the best way um, to go about doing that for the Broke Melbourne Dale area. If any of um, the participants today were interested in in uh, forming a group. So in the Broke Milberdale area, I'd get in contact with the Broke Bogle Land Care and see if there's some interest there. I know that a few of their members are interested in baiting. Uh, otherwise, you can get in contact with LLS and we can help facilitate that process. Same with any area. If there's a group of people, we'll come along, we'll help set you up. And if you need to go down that formalised route, we'll provide assistance and advice there um, to get you started. So first off, I'd say start talking to your neighbours, start seeing whether people are interested, as well as uh, try and talk to your, the Broke Bogle Land Care Group. I know that Roy Palmer would be a good uh, contact to get in contact there. So thanks everyone for listening to me. Um, I feel that you should all have a bit of information to go forward now. Hopefully you can start to get in contact with your neighbours and start to coordinate a good program. Good morning everyone, my name is Roy Palmer and I live at 952 Milbrida Road Broke and I'm on a voluntary conservation agreement block of land which is 10 hectares and of that 8.5 hectares represents the conservation area. My back boundary is Yengo National Park and my front boundary is Milbrida Road. Now Milbrida Road is 14 kilometres long and I have a frontage to that road of 300 metres. So I'm roughly one fiftieth of the length. And from there, from what I can gather, myself and one other landholder is doing baiting and no one else is along the lock, along the road. And what I believe and would really like to see is a few groups of four to five landholders who are prepared to get together to attack this whole process of feral animals um, and select the part of the land which they are familiar with and then from there they can do what they need to do over a period of time but nothing will happen quickly. National parks are actually doing aerial baiting of Yango but Yango is such a big park that it's very difficult to um, to actually cover it adequately and uh, aerial baiting is only something at the rate of three to four baits per kilometre and that's hardly adequate for the number of dogs and boxes that are up there. So that's the first exercise. The second part, which is important from my point of view, is that the agreement was made on the premise that I would start protecting a particular bird called a speckled warbler, which is highly threatened in the area and hadn't been seen for some while. Um, so once I started baiting within a couple of years, I had two and three families of them actually uh, feeding off the front lawn. Now, the big thing about them is that they are a ground breeding bird and the foxes have predated them for a very long time. And so the end result is they never were able to get on top of it. So I'm pleased to see that we're actually making some headway in that regard. The agreement was made in 2004 and I've been baiting since 2000 using 1080 which I was a bit apprehensive to use because it's such a powerful um, chemical but realising at the other hand once I start to research it a bit was it was made up from compounds which are native to the broke area uh, not particularly because it was developed in Western Australia but essentially the same sort of plants are growing here and uh, have caused a lot of problems to the landholders many years ago and so subsequently more has been eradicated. Um, so with that knowledge, then you realise that native animals are probably immune to the substance as opposed to the introduced animals, dogs, cats, foxes, etc. So that's why they're so susceptible. In the early days, when I first came here and started the baiting, um, I was fairly naive, I think, in terms of what I expected, but I probably picked up I don't know, five to six, maybe ten a year. And that was through inexperience on my part, picking the right tracks to work with um, and roughly how to find a, a location which actually I could bait 
and know that something was going to come and eat it. So that has now increased now, so I'm in a situation where I'm probably, uh, the, my baits are being taken probably at the rate which enables me to get at 40 to 80 a year, whatever it is, dogs or foxes. Um, now, prior to that, prior to the last few years, there was no prescribed number of baits per property. And now it has become a prescribed exercise, so this 25 acres will only take two baits at any one time. Which then means that you have to be very selective in terms of where you bait, otherwise you're wasting your time just plonking a bait down on 25 acres and expecting something to happen. The baits on offer are two types. One is fresh meat, which is generally lamb's hearts, and that is injected with 1080 poison concentrate. And the other one is a meat composition, which is made by a company, and they inject into that meat composition the poison, and it is offered to us like a cube, maybe 30 mil, 30 mil, 30 mil. And so that is something, both of those are, can only be secured through LLS, and for them to give it to you, you have to have a chemical handling card, which they will um, instruct you in a school to which you, you will then use that as the entree to get hold of the baits. That's the only way you can possibly acquire them. Um, the, the, um, the composition ones, they are, have a longer shelf life than the um, fresh meat, obviously, and so they're a better proposition for people who don't have a, a dedicated fridge for this because 1080 as a poison can become impregnated into all sorts of uh, materials that we use, plastics and the like, and so they're dangerous, need to be considered. In the ground, um, if it's dry ground, you can probably get between eight and 10 days before they need to be replaced um, because the, the actual chemical starts to break down and as a consequence, its strength isn't there, which is the case of fox off and dog on. Now, um, with those two, which are the composition ones, they are very useful in terms of dry country, but when it gets to the wet area, not quite so useful because they absorb moisture. So within three days of a really good shower of rain, they will decompose into a mush, which is really very unattractive to the dogs. So uh, when, if there is a shower that occurs while you have got baits out, either regardless of whether they are one or the other, um, you'll generally find raining on the mound, which we'll talk about in a moment, um, actually starts to congeal or, or come together. So you end up with a crust developing on the top of the mound. And I would generally make a habit of every time there's a shower of rain to break that crust up a bit so that in fact the odour can get through from the actual bait through to the um, through the outside of the, for the dogs to actually pick it up. If in fact you're having trouble with wet weather, um, you can always, or what I've done as a practice, is you can actually lay at the bottom of the area that you're going to put the bait, lined with uh, dried leaves or bark, which then takes up the moisture as opposed to the bait taking up the moisture, and then backfill from there. Um, and that still leaves it fairly palatable. Um, the mound is generally, I would make it probably 30 to 40 centimetres in diameter and probably 20 centimetres high and like a cone. And um, it will then, and also clear around the, the, the circumference of the mound because that way if it's clear you may be able to pick up the footprints of whatever animal has taken the bait. So that's one of those things that um, you'll pick up as you go along and you'll, you gain confidence in seeing what type of prints they are, big ones, small ones, etc. There is another form which is known as an ejector device and that requires the dog to pull a piece of dried meat off a particular piece of metal which is fixed to an ejector gun which has a cartridge of 1080 in it. So once the dog pulls the, the bait on the top that releases the pin which then fires into the capsule and sprays 1080 directly into the mouth.
Um, it's a very much more direct way of going, but it's an expensive exercise. You're up for equipment plus re refill capsules. Um, now, to select, for me to select the um, the best bait location is, I'd, I'd walk the block a number of times, and most of you probably do that anyway. But in there, you'll find tracks coming in from the park, um, and there'd be probably five to ten, which are very noticeable. Um, so they're the ones that you would bait on. The next thing is to find an intersecting track which is coming at it from 90 degrees or thereabouts. Once you've got the, the intersection taking place, I would be baiting directly in one of the, uh, the apex of the corner um, vectors so, so that you're actually attracting whatever's coming in on any direction going either way, be it in or out of the park uh, and similarly across the park. So that thing gives you the best chance of getting a cape. Um, the thing that you'll find is the roo tracks are there, very visible and worn. So the thing is to find ones which are worn as opposed to ones which are just there. A worn one is, you can see from the brush tail, the tail of tail brushing along, uh, that they are actually actively using it. And once you know that, well then you would, you would probably uh, bait on either side of that or if it's coming from both directions and through the intersection, well, it doesn't much matter where you bait. But the main thing is to get them started. So, having reached this point, sometimes, uh, on the camera we've found, is two dogs will approach the same bait simultaneously. And uh, I'm not quite sure how they sort that out and who draws the, the short straw, but at the end of the day, one goes away happy and the other one goes up and he's happy. Um, and they'll die, one of them will. And what they're really seeking is 350 grams of meat. They must have the minimum of 350 grams of fresh meat to sustain them in the wild. Now 350 grams is like the size of a small of a fist or something of the order of an animal like the size of a rat. And the thing is they've got to have that every day, not just some days. So what they do is they resort to all manner of trying to kill um, animals of all descriptions and be it lizards, snakes, possums, um, bandicoots, kangaroos and wallabies, all of that is in their, their range and their menu and they don't much care as long as they get the required number, the amount, required amount of fresh meat. Now the essence of that is that one dog one living for 350, 65 days uses up nearly a tonne of meat. If you then extrapolate that out and say if there's 100 dogs, well you're getting to 1,200 tonnes ultimately. And so not knowing how many there are in the park which are there and how many are breeding and every female has around about six to eight pups, be it fox or dog, uh, every year we're extending the whole process out further and further so a thousand dogs would would come in at something like about 1200 or 128 tons of meat which has all got to be found from somewhere now they'll get it from roadkill they'll get it from native animals they'll get it from cattle they'll get it from small foals they'll get it from whatever they can get it from so ultimately that's their aim so that's why they're actually hunting as individuals or hunting as packs and when it gets to the point of packs, it's very scary from the point of view of us as humans, because essentially we're only just another prey, really. Probably we're a little bit more advanced than they are, but that's the, the way they would see us. So we've just got to be super careful about that and realise that they are multiplying at a rate which you can hardly believe. But linked to that is the fact that if people don't tie their dogs up at night and they think that that's unnecessary because the dogs are asleep before they go to bed um, I'd like you to think again because essentially what they do is they sleep all day and hunt all night and because dogs can travel up to 40 kilometers um, to them going to Cessnock or going to Singleton is really just an average day's work so they'll get out and come back again in the course of the night and then they'll sleep for the day and then they'll go out again that night so while ever you haven't got them tethered that's what they're actually up to, be it foraging forests or whether they're actually 
working domestically in terms of garbage things and all that sort of thing up to them obviously but that's where the problem lies so unless we tether them we will have this continual problem associated with dogs roaming around right through the night and no one knowing where they are except for the fact in the morning they're half asleep most of the day now if we then take on top of that the fact of cats which we haven't haven't actually um, approached yet cats are really difficult in fact they're very difficult um, number one they only eat what they kill number two they don't actually need liquid because they use the blood from what they kill to give them the liquid they need so they are actually self-sustained within themselves there's an, there's an estimate of 75 million feral cats in Australia and when you consider what they're capable of eating in terms of birds and the like um, they're a very dangerous animal to deal with so dead baits are of no value to them at all um, however I'm at the present moment I'm taking on a bit of a project to myself to see if I can trap a cat and I'm using sardines to see whether that will attract them enough to get into the trap set the ma mechanism off and enable the trap door to drop and I have a wild cat, feral cat but this is a bit like a pipe dream really because I'm totally a novice at that I've got no understanding really of cats outside of knowing what they do generally so it's a work in progress for me and um, it's only by trying that I'll gain the experience that maybe enables me to catch cats at some stage. So in conclusion, I'd like to encourage all of you to think about grouping maybe three or four of you together and do a concerted effort in trying to clear a patch. My 300 metres is really a tiny bit by comparison to the rest of the road. Um, it's a case of how many landholders are prepared to actually attempt to do something about it and then proceed it's not difficult it's really just a case of dedication to the to the actual baiting process and um and i it would be really good because at this present moment we're going into the breeding season which will start in about six weeks time and then we'll get a whole new generation of dogs cats and and foxes so now is the time to try and group to a point where if we can capitalize on the foxes um, dispersing as they do in about September or October all those young ones are really easy to catch it's the older ones that are the difficult ones to deal with so I'll leave you with that and thank you very much Hi, my name's Peter Raw. Um, I'm here today to um, run you through um, some vertebrate pest control techniques. Um, so, types of pests and fauna, uh, the control methods, and a bit of a demonstration uh, with a few of the traps. So, the pest fauna we're looking at today are wild dogs, foxes, rabbits, hares, pigs, and deer. So the control methods we're going to run through are biological control uh, for rabbits. We've got Calicia virus and myxomatosis, 1080 baiting, which are meat baits, manufactured baits, ejector baits for dog, foxes, rabbits, hares and pigs. Uh, we'll also run through cage trapping uh, for pigs, foxes, dogs and cats. Soft jaw trapping for dogs, foxes, cats, rabbits and hares. Uh, shooting, pretty much all those animals, deer, dogs, foxes, rabbits, hares and pigs and also mechanical control which, um, which is ripping warrens. So the biological control, um, Galicia virus um, for rabbit. Galicia virus disease is a viral disease uh, which affects only European rabbits and myxomatosis is a viral disease that affects rabbit population depending on weather conditions. Um, it's carried by mosquitoes, so um, in those conditions, yeah, it should should uh, be effective. Um, with the 1080 baiting, uh, wild dog and foxes, so we've got notification three to ten days 
before program commences um, by letter, email, phone call or public notice. Um, site selection uh, for dog, uh, would be uh, dog sightings, uh, tracks and trails um, in accordance with the pest control order. Uh, established bait sites, uh, check and re-establish bait sites weekly. Uh, collection of untaken baits uh, is pretty important to so see you don't get any um, off target kills. Uh, GPS location of all sites so you can just demonstrate on um, where you've placed the baits and, um, and it's good for recording uh, the number of baits taken um, and what the baits were taken by. Um, this can be determined by um, trail cameras or also um, yeah, just the way the bait site has been disturbed. So if it's torn right apart, um, it's more likely a dog. And if it's just a little hole in the side of the bait site, it's more or less a, a fox that's taken the bait. Um, 1080 baiting wild dogs and foxes. So it's um, you need to be qualified to, to put out the baits, collect the baits from local land services. Um, you need a chem cert or your pinned on 1080 uh, course. So follow the PCO, uh, limit of 10 baits per kilometre of trail, or a maximum of 20 baits per 100 hectares. So notification, minimum three days, all properties within one kilometre of, of baiting. So it's important to inform your neighbours and local locals of what's going on. Uh, the distance from houses, and habitats, so we've got five metres from boundaries, 50 metres from habitats, property owners, otherwise 150 metres from others, um, 10 metres from domestic water, water supply. So here are some photographs of um, some meat baits that have been injected by local land services. Um, the middle slide is um, some manufactured baits, it's already the 1080 inside. And the last is a ejector bait, uh, which mechanism, which um, it'll uh, in directly inject the uh, the poison into the, the dog or fox when it um, pulls up on the bait. We'll demonstrate that in a minute. So these are some um, bait sites in the field. Um, there's some normally you just hump the dirt up and put the bait in under the dirt and um, foxes and dogs will sniff that out and, and take that. And also there's an ejector, that, looking down from, a, from the top, there's an ejector bait which has um, been set up for, um, for dogs or foxes. So here's a video of me um, just at home setting up, just as demonstration purposes, setting up a um, ejector bait. So um, I'll just run this through and explain how it's done. So we just um, have the um, ejector mechanism. Um, you just slide it into a, um, a device which sets your um, ejector. Now it's just taken out. It's just a demonstration there of how it goes off. Yeah, so that um, yeah, slides down and, and locks in. Uh, once we have that um, in place, we, we hammer this pin into the ground which um, which the ejector sits inside. So, um, yeah, depending on how hard the ground is, it's, um, it's normally not too bad to, to get in, but you don't want it coming out when a dog or a fox pulls up. Yeah, so we just make, make a little divot around to get the ejector in a little bit further um, just so we can that's a that's our lure that um, the 1080 goes into that screws on top of our ejector it's important to have glasses and gloves on when we do this um, it's a um, yeah you don't want it going off in your face so that's um, pretty well set in place now there's no poison in there so I'm just going to pull up 
on the top to demonstrate how it goes off. Poison will come out once the dog or fox pulls up. So they can be left in the ground for a fair while. Um, yeah, they're easy to install and remove. Once again, by qualified people. Yeah. So now we go into um, baiting rabbits, hares, and pigs. So similar techniques are used for for the three animals. So. Um, so we also need a notification again, three to ten days uh, before program commences, um, either by letter or phone, calls, emails, public notices in accordance with the PCO, um, site selection. So we've got to choose a site where um, pigs or rabbits or hares frequently um, visit or feed. Um, so once you find your site, establish a free feeding area where grain or carrots are put out for a number of days, five to seven days. Uh, so you calculate each day how much food the, um, the animal's been eating, or the animals, and then you uh, work out uh, once they've sort of um, come to a, once they stop sort of overeating and, and looking for more, you know, the, the, the numbers are pretty well right as far as the kilos and um, yeah so we GPS the location um, poison the feed by LLS um, based on the kilos of free feed taken and establish the bait um, after the pigs have eaten or the rabbits have eaten the, the bait uh, we collect the poison uh, poison animals uneaten poison bait and dispose of, uh, so we bury that, or we'll take it to a waste depot. Document number of animals poisoned, kilos poison eaten and collected. So we get a, so now there's just a few photos there of um, putting out some grain for pigs. So the first photo shows um, the grain put, being put out. We actually put a bit of molasses on top just to try and attract them in. The second photo shows um, the bait site completely taken and um, so that was re-established for about five or six days and then this, the last photo shows the poison um, put out and um, yeah we got a pretty good result from, from that program. So cage trapping, I brought a cage trap in to demonstrate. Um, this is a cage trap for a a fox or a cat. Yeah, so basically um, they come in all different sizes. So this cage trap is designed for a, mainly a cat, probably a small fox. Um, so it's simply set up by um, opening that door putting the lock in there and then putting feet at the back of the, the trap so that um, when the when the dog uh, the fox or the um, cat puts its foot on there the door will sharp just like that so uh, and then the animals disposed of humanely um, so yeah we've got to establish these traps in a shaded or sheltered area um, a bit they're to be checked daily, preferably in the morning, um, and then yeah, euthanised humanely. Uh, the trap can be reset or put on a different location, depending on the number of cats or um, foxes you have around. And it's always important to try and keep any human scent off the uh, the cage, uh, so give them a good clean in between traps and use gloves. So there's a few uh, photos there, similar to one we've got here on, on site. So we've got the cage trap and then the second slide we've got um, two kittens in the, or three kittens in the trap. Now those kittens actually went to a good home. Uh, they were relocated through, um, through the council. So um, cage trapping, targeting pigs. So again, site selection. 
we need to um, make sure we're picking a site where the animals frequently visit, similar to the, the baiting, 1080 baiting. Um, so set up the trap, um, we actually free feed in the trap uh, for a few days and we have like cameras on those traps so we know how many pigs are coming and going and when we think we've got all the number of pigs going in and out of the trap, uh, the trap's set so it'll go off when the pigs go in and um, yeah once pigs, one, once they're customised to entering and leaving the trap uh, so check the trap daily and euthanise pigs humanely so again uh, those pigs don't need to go to a waste depot but um, dispose of those in a, in a, in a pit or a, so you can bury them. There's just a few photos of a, of a cage trap for pigs, there's a few bit different ones on the market but these ones you can actually build at home, they're a bit of work. Um, and then the second photo obviously shows um, pigs being caught. Yeah, so they're um, a couple of photos. Um, so soft jaw trapping is another technique uh, for wild dogs and foxes. So again, we've got to select a site, um, appropriate site based on you know sightings and um, tracks and monitoring. Um, so established traps, you also want to put them in a shade, like a sheltered area if possible. So we GPS the area and um, and check them preferably early morning. So And then once a dog or a fox is caught in those traps, we euthanise them humanely and uh, reset the trap either in a similar spot or, um, or in another area depending on numbers. So this is a, um, this is a typical uh, dog trap or a fox trap that um, that we bought in today to show you. Um, there's a fair bit of work in um, setting up the trap. Uh, you can't just buy one off the shelf. Uh, the traps need to be set up properly and people that use them really need to be trained. Uh, there's a fair bit in them. So we've got um, a few photos here. One of um, a, a trap being set so obviously the, the trap's in the ground, they're buried under the ground, the dirt's put back over the top. So you can't see the trap once it's in there, they've got to be fully camouflaged. And then there's a few photos there of the trap going off, that's actually two different locations. And this is uh, a slide I'll show you just of a little bit of uh, work we do in preparing traps for sites. There's, um, this is boiling the traps, so in between baiting, uh, trapping we've got to um, Boil the traps so that they're well, not sterile, but so that there's no scent on them, and also there's wax in there as well, which um, lubricates the um, the trap itself. So we we put the trap in and um, and boil it for 10 or 15 minutes, depending on the condition of the trap, and um, and then they're just set aside to dry, and they're pretty much ready to go for the next time. Uh, this next slide shows um, setting a trap so we try not to disturb the area little as possible so we just set the trap first and just make sure it's working properly uh, we'll find out put it in place to see how it looks and again this is not this is not where I, where I'd set a trap but um, it's just for demonstration purposes so once you have it trap sort of set you sit it on the ground to see where it's sitting and how it's sitting um, put it aside you know, scrape any debris off the top put that aside because that'll go on last and we dig out any dirt we need to dig out and it goes into a sieve uh, we sieve the dirt back on later so once we um, <coughs> get to the required depth we um, place the trap in, so it's important we don't disturb the area. Um, the traps are normally pegged down, so we put two two fairly big pegs inside the um, underneath the trap to hold the the trap in place once once a dog's caught, because they do um, struggle obviously to try and get out once they're caught. So you don't want to lose it. There's a trap or a dog once you've caught. 
Um, yeah, so I'll pop the trap back in the, in the hole. I won't peg it down for this um, demonstration, but you can also tie it to a, a tree or a post and um, also put on a drag so the drag will slow the dog down, it won't go too far, or fox for that matter. And the same process uh, for, for catching rabbits as well. So there's a fair bit of work involved um, just in setting a trap, so yeah, that's probably going to be just about done. So once, uh, once all the dirt's in, we don't want any rocks going in because that can, um, can catch, catch on the jaws and release the, uh, the dog. Yeah, so we just level it off, keep it, keep it sort of normal level, like on ground level. Um, I haven't worried about dressing it up too much with um, leaves or grass or bits and pieces because um, it's in an area where there's pretty much dirt anyway so you want to keep it sort of how it was and I'll set this trap off in a minute um, I've got a pressure gauge that we use to, to set the trap uh, to check whether the trap will go off and normally it's around about two pound of pressure on that gauge which is about the pressure of a, a dog or a fox and you want a bit lighter pressure if it's a rabbit or a cat so that's about it for the dog um, so in any program um, yes we don't always get every animal so um, we go through afterwards and, and do a shoot so and you might just want to do a shoot as an initial program if, there's, if you know there's only one or two problem dogs or um, deer or rabbits so um, yeah obviously require a firearm licence and also neighbours uh, notification of neighbours and also the police and mechanical so there's mechanical ways we can keep out unwanted vermin so we've got um, ripping rabbit warren so uh, that'll disrupt the, um, the life cycle of the rabbits and um, it's just another add-on to what uh, we all already have in place also uh, real f also fencing so we can also fence out rabbits dogs foxes whatever you, you want to fence out um, can be quite expensive um, just depends on you know the, the amount of area you've got to cover and also how valuable your, your livestock are. Uh, that's about it for today. I hope you found it interesting and um, thanks very much. Hi everyone, it's Rosemary again. I hope you enjoyed the um, presentation put together by my husband, Peter. Um, Peter's actually not here today. He's um, out working. So I um, just thought I'd sit in here to answer any questions that may have come in. At the moment, I don't think there's any questions that have come in, but I thought I'd just finish up by um, outlining some of the questions that we sometimes get asked when out trapping or baiting. So um, one of the regular questions that we might get asked when we're, oh, Peter's out doing soft jaw trapping is um, what happens if my domestic Oh, my pet dog's foot gets stuck in it um, in the trap by accident and the answer to that question is you'll have a dog that's got a pretty sore soft tissue injury for probably about a week um, might be limping around a little but after a week or two weeks your dog should be fully back to normal there should be no broken bones um, and you know it'll survive just fine um, another um, one that we get regularly is, oh, because I don't know where you put the trap, is am I likely to, if, if I accidentally step in it, will it break my ankle? Um, in answer to that question, usually um, a person's foot or boot um, is kind of bigger than the, the uh, soft jaw trap. If it does kind of close in on um, your boot, 
you should have no injury whatsoever. I mean, you're probably scared more than anything. Um, another question that we've um, been asked before, um, have you ever trapped anything um, that hasn't been targeted? And usually um, Peter will go out and do trapping for um, wild dogs um, in most cases. Um, the off um, the off-target trapping that's occurred um, has um, fortunately been other pests. So he's caught um, cats in his trap before, pigs, um, rabbits um, in the dog traps, and of course foxes. So um, definitely you can get um, off-target animals. Um, luckily we haven't um, captured anything else. but. If there was a case where you'd captured um, a native animal by accident, um, like for instance a quoll, um, you can open the trap. The quoll or the native animal that may have been captured will have a sore foot. It shouldn't be any broken bones and you should be able to release them and after a week or so um, they, their foot should be back to full health. Um, I think that's probably about all the um, the questions that we usually get asked. Um, apart from um, you know uh, about the 1080 baiting, which is probably best answered by um, local land services um, with relation to um, poisoning. Um, if your dog takes a bait, you know what are the impacts. Um, my only answer to that question would be if my dog, my pet dog, took a 1080 bait, I'd recommend you just get it to a vet as soon as you can uh, for treatment. Um, thanks very much for um, um, tuning in today. And uh, I'll finish up now, but in a minute or two, Eva will be back on just to wrap up the whole um um, presentation and um, thanks very much for tuning in. Stay healthy, safe and well, um, both yourself and your families and um, enjoy this isolation, um, social distancing period. Um, you've all got beautiful places out there in the Broke Milverdale area so yeah, enjoy them um, while this COVID-19 uh, situation lasts. Thanks very much. Hello, I'd um, just like to um, thank everyone for uh, joining in uh, today's uh, live stream workshop. Uh, this, is, uh, this is one of our first workshops, so um, it's been great having you with us today. Uh, and also I'd like to uh, thank everyone, um, all, the, all the landholders that, were, that participated in the Wildlife Camera Monitoring Program. Um, your, um, your assistance with that program uh, is, was great and, and as I mentioned earlier, this will um, assist in, in um, identifying uh, options uh, for feral animal control uh, in the Milbordale Broke area. 
Uh, also, I'd just like to mention that um, just below your, uh, the YouTube video under descriptions, uh, there are a series of links to uh, a number of different um, sources. So uh, we've got links to FeralScan, uh, PestSmart, uh, as well as uh, the Hunter Regional uh, Pest Animal uh, Management Plan. Uh, and links to um, and, the, and the Hunter Local Land Services uh, staff contact li links as well. Uh, so if, if you are interested in, in forming a group or um, uh, undertaking a uh, coordinated trapping or baiting program, please contact uh, either Matt, Matt Kennedy uh, or Kyra O'Brien or myself uh, and, um, and we can work with uh, um, our way forward and identifying the best approach uh, and identify what assistance you require, whether it be uh, training or uh, providing you with additional resources. Okay, thank you very much and I hope you enjoyed the workshop.